right, for our first session, let's welcome Fumiya Nakatsuhara, Reader in Language Assessment at the Center for Research in English Language Learning and Assessment, CRILA, University of Bedfordshire. Lynn May, Senior Lecturer in, TES in TESOL at the Queensland University of Technology. And Nahal Kabazbashi, Senior Lecturer in Language Assessment at CRILA, University of Bedfordshire as well. So we welcome our presenters. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for coming to our presentation. I'm Fumio Nakatsuhara from University of Bedfordshire. I work for Cruella Research Center, Center for Research in English Language Learning and Assessment. Hi, everyone. I'm Lynn May from the Queensland University of uh, Technology in Australia. Our third author, Nahala Kawasubashi, unfortunately can't be with us. So two of us are presenting this paper. First of all, we'd like to acknowledge that this project is funded and supported by the IELTS partners. Thank you so much. All right. In the past 15 or 16 months, I'm sure that all of us here have been involved in some sort of online teaching or online communication in educational settings. And it is very likely that online or hybrid teaching is to continue in some capacity as a response to the COVID-19 pandemic. But it is also true that we have demonstrated potential for increasing the accessibility and the reach of higher education provision. That is actually a good thing. Isbell and Kremel have recently reviewed seven at-home proficiency tests, including IELTS indicator and TOEFL IBT, which are used for university admission purposes. And the question we'd like to ask here is whether these tests are reflecting the construct of online academic speaking. But before that, we have more fundamental question. What is the online academic speaking construct? Dukas and Brown 10 years ago did this research. So they looked at language functions elicited in face-to-face -face classrooms and language functions elicited in IELTS speaking test and compared between the two. They used O'Sullivan et al's language functions checklist and they modified it a bit and then they applied to real life and IELTS um, speaking test. Okay. This research was really useful to evaluate the extent to which IELTS reflects real life face-to-face -face communication. But the question here, what we want to know is the construct of academic speaking in digital settings. So we decided to draw upon this research and do something similar, but for digital communication. Here are our research questions. What are the language functions and skills required for speaking in technology-mediated academic environments? Number two, what are teachers' and students' perceptions of effective speaking in those environments? To answer these questions, we collected data from Australia and the UK. We gathered over 40 hours of video recordings, including 17 lectures, tutorials from four undergraduate and postgraduate units in Australian University, and 23 online PhD supervision meetings from a UK university. We also carried out online survey and semi-structured interviews with selected students and teachers. And like Dukas and Brown, we also used O'Sullivan et al's function checklist, but we got to revise the function, um, the range of functions to suit our data set. And then we did one day workshop and a series of CODA reliability checks, and we reached 90.3% agreement. And for the survey and interview data, we did thematic analysis. Okay, this is the list of um, summary of language functions. So on the left hand side, you see O'Sullivan Netta's original checklist, and on the right hand side, you see our modified checklist. We made um, some major revisions. One of them was that, as you see in the interactional functions line, 
we significantly increased the number of interactional functions from 13 to 23. And we also added one extra macro language function category called use of technology functions. So in total, we have four macro categories, informational, interactional, managing interaction, and use of technology functions. Okay. And what we want to note here is that we applied that language function checklist not only to spoken contributions, but also for chat contributions. So this is the um, worksheet we used when we were coding the data. In the middle columns, you see tutor slash supervisor and class slash student. They are for spoken contributions. And on the right hand side, you see use of chat teacher, use of chat students, and they are for chat contributions. And whenever we observed function, we just ticked and then transcribed them. So now I'm going to talk a bit about results, focusing on spoken contributions. And later on, Lin is going to talk about how students and teachers integrate the two, spoken and the chat um, function. But because of the time, we can't uh, present everything, so it's going to be very selective, I'm afraid. So this is the list of interactional functions, and I want to focus on disagreeing and qualifying on contribution in response to a challenge. Here in this graph, you see four different colors, green taught module student, blue supervision student, yellow taught module teacher, and orange supervision teacher, okay? And if you look at this number 19, disagreeing, you see that compared to other three groups, PhD supervisors disagreed a lot. And naturally, in response to disagreement, PhD students needed to qualify their own contribution in response, OK? Let's take a look at some examples. So here, three quotes were taken from different supervision meetings. I'm not quite sure why you have chosen that framework. I don't see it being fully justified by what you are presenting. Is that a good result from your point of view? Okay, we are going to agree to disagree on this. Aha. So here you can really see that um, teachers disagree with students very skillfully using hedges, implicature and humor. This is uh, perhaps to maintain the rapport, the relationship between them, and it's really nicely done. Here you see a beautiful sequence of disagreement and qualifying on contribution. So in this uh, conversation, teachers questioning the value of including literature review on reading, and then student is defending the point. But whether you'd like to include the reading part where your focus is speaking, really, is another question. And student says, all right, but I mean, I mentioned it just, just because I'm reporting what they looked at to show that there is not a lot of research in general, because that's only come up as 6% out of everything. And most of it is writing. That's the point I'm trying to come across there. But teacher wasn't really uh, convinced. Yeah, but we can do without reading, possibly. And here you see managing interaction category and use of technology category. And I want to focus on initiating new interaction and resolving a technical issue. If you look at this um, managing interaction function number 39, initiating, you see that taught module students had very limited opportunities to initiate topics. And it is actually understandable that in taught class with many students, there are really limited opportunities. But it seems that online environment double the difficulty. So we saw many instances of preliminary questions like this. Can I just say something first? So they needed to really explicitly say when to chip in. And for resolving technical issues, look at this. 
um, it's not all the time, but fair amount of um, resolving technical issue functions were used. And here are examples. Okay, so this is um, after teacher shared the screen with the document. The document was too small, so teacher said, "Do you see? I can see, but not very clearly at all." Oh yes, too small. And the teacher enlarged document. And the student says, "Yes, okay, I can see it." So it seems that for both teachers and students, being able to handle and resolve technical issue by spoken language was very important. Okay. Right. I'd like to um, to share with you the results uh, from our study in terms of the integration of spoken and chat contributions. So what became very apparent to us as we analysed the data was the multimodal kind of nature, the, the very integrated. So there was engagement, there was synchronous and contingent engagement, substantive engagement in um, through spoken and written communication. Uh, the written communication happened uh, typically through the comment box using the chat function and the chat function was used by both teachers and students but actually mainly by students. So um, the range, I think we were quite surprised by the range of functions uh, that chat was used for in, in addition to sort of social functions that we might have expected, you know, greeting, thanking, um, bidding farewell. Um, students and uh, tutors provided academic input um, they were able to ask questions, particularly students ask a lot of questions through chat. They were able to comment on um, the tutor's contribution, their own contributions, ask for more information, ask for opinions, um, and very importantly, I think, share links to resources as well. So we're going to have a look at some examples of uh, what this actually looked like in terms of using the chat. Just before we do that, um, some insights was that they saw that there were two quite distinct contexts for academic speaking in the digital age. So one of these contexts was where there were smaller tutorials um, and smaller tended to be less than 20. Um, so the, in these groups, uh, what typically happened was that everybody had their camera on, everybody had the mic switched on, um, and they may also use the comment box as well. But a lot of the interaction was speaking and listening. Um, and you can see here a couple of uh, comments from students. So a postgraduate student talks about how, you know, in smaller groups, um, she felt it was just like a normal face-to-face -face conversation. You know, she could build up that rapport. And um, in particular, when everybody was able to have all their cameras on, um, then that was really important for her. Um, an undergraduate student um, pointed to the fact that uh, using chat enabled him to um, ask a question uh, which was an alternative to actually a spoken question if he didn't feel confident. So that's kind of an interesting aspect of chat use. Um, now the second context for uh, use here or uh, in terms of online tutorials was the larger, and this could be actually very, very large, up to 100 students attending um, in a kind of group. And in this sort of uh, context, um, basically students had their cameras and mics off and most of their participation, most of the interaction from students was through the comment box. And we can find their perspectives here. So we have a postgraduate student, you know, commenting on the complexity of it all. So she, as she says, even though she's good at multi-skilling, it's still quite difficult, you know, to read, to see what's going on in the chat box, because when she's focusing on that, she's not really focusing on what the tutor is actually talking about. Um, a kind of uh, a positive comment from the, uh, but also pointing to the need for the tutor to facilitate both the spoken interaction and the chat interaction is from another postgraduate student who says, you know, in a large group, it's really good to be able to put your question or contribution through chat and have it noted at the same time as someone else is speaking. And of course, then the, the responsibility is on the facilitator to refer to those questions and integrate them as they come in. Now there's examples we promised. Okay, so here's an example of integrated exchanges. So what sort of really fascinated us about this kind of exchange where you can see that the tutor 
is speaking, that's the tutor's contribution is in blue and that's spoken. The student's contribution in this interaction is all through chat, but it, it, it is completely synchronous. It's completely, you know, contingent. And what's happening is that there are, as Alexander would say, there are sort of um, chains, links of substantive content um, here. So the, the teacher begins by um, asking for uh, sort of in comments from the readings and you can see that you know student one comments teacher uh, responds to that comment student two then student three um, comment as well um, and that goes on for five students and for each comment through chat the teacher takes that up and um, sort of includes that in the next uh, comment that they make Another thing that we found interesting was the use of chat function to comment on um, others' contributions, but also to ask the tutor questions. A lot of questions were asked. Um, so we see here that um, student two uses chat who's following up on the tutor who's been describing a particular type of pedagogy with second language learners and comments, you know, uh, um, adds to, to that by saying we use that role structure when I work. And what the teacher does, just in case someone's not sorry, the tutor does, just in case someone's not actually following the comment boxes, she actually repeats that comment and then builds on it. Okay, and she does that with um, both of these comments. Um, and then of course, in the student three uh, chat comment is, is actually uh, two questions to the tutor, which the, the tutor actually repeats and then responds to. Chat can also be used to share links to resources um, as they're actually being discussed. So these are some of the really sort of uh, great affordances of, of this sort of synchronous contingent multimodal communication. So the teacher um, introduces, sorry, the tutor here introduces uh, a case study on Tue um, from Pacific Islander background and um, then asks the students and the students respond through chat. Um, and you know the teacher responds to their comments and you'll see student three at the bottom then shares the actual document that they're talking about shares the link to that just in case anyone um, in that tutor group has not actually um, had access to it we found also that students use chat to have um, kind of synchronous discussions among themselves so you know while while the tutor was actually possibly explaining um, concepts the students were having their their own sort of synchronous discussions and again that was sharing experiences sharing resources um, and links so that was a you know a, I think quite a very important um, aspect of of uh, interaction and um, you know co-constructing knowledge that was happening through chat the last example we want to show you is a student using chat to initiate a private discussion with the tutor. So just as in a face-to-face -face tutorial where, you know, perhaps you have group work and then a, a student wants to talk to you privately or perhaps before or after the tut, um, you know, this can happen um, through chat as well. So here's a student who messages the tutor privately. And um, as you can see, you know, has quite a substantive contribution there. The tutor responds to it and the, the student thanks them for that. So what are the implications of this talkative mix, this very multimodal um, integrated talkative mix? Well, in terms of um, the construct, you know, what's at the heart of all this, I guess, is what is the construct of academic speaking in the digital age? From our study, it becomes very clear about the integrated nature of the language skills that are needed. Um, as you can see from this list here, there's a great deal happening. Um, there's speaking, interactive listening, reading, viewing, responding. Um, there's shared documents, there's videos being played and then responded to. And all the while, there's reading and responding to comments in the chat box. So this, the nature of this um, communication is at its heart multimodal and it's extremely complex. So and it can have different contexts as well as the context that the students pointed out, which is, you know, the smaller and the larger context. There's also when the group itself is in whole group mode and then there's breakout rooms um, as well as these. So we've got a very sort of um, talkative mix here in that's uh, drawing on all sorts of well, all language skills, actually, all macro skills of language. So we want to thank you very much for listening to our presentation.
Right. Thank you so much, Fumio and Lynn and Hal, of course, for that interesting presentation. So, well, let's see if we have any questions from the audience right now. Um, okay, let's check here. Well, maybe while our audience presents some questions, uh, I'm going to, to ask you something. So I'm going to add you here now. Hello. Um, well, so while, while our audience uh, presents questions here, I would like to ask you something about the, um, the role of, of humor maybe during these interactions through the private chat, something that me, you mentioned uh, a while ago. Uh, I would like to know maybe if the inclusion of uh, GIFs and emojis has some sort of impact on the emotional filter and maybe can uh, encourage students to, to participate more, feel more confident and well, any in the end have an, uh, a good impact on their level? I'll, I'll answer that one if I may. Um, they weren't used very often at all. There was only um, a sort of a smiley face, but not an emoji. <laughs> when you kind of um, use your keyboard to make a smiley face. Um, what was interesting to me was that students corrected their own spelling mistakes <laughs> um, in chat, but no, that the gifts and emojis weren't weren't a feature of that at all, really, Sebastian. Yeah, right. but actually, the use of humor was really interesting in spoken contributions. I'm talking about uh, sp spoken and not not chat contributions. Oh, yeah. Actually, we used lots of humor and the jokes because it is actually really difficult to connect to the you know the participants or actually as we are doing now, it is really difficult to connect to, to the other person on the, on the different side of the screen. So we tended to use lots of jokes and, and, and humor so that we feel that we are together and we, you know, we are in the same platform and talking together. Oh, all right, yeah, definitely, I understand. Yeah, in, in different platforms like Teams, for example, we tend to use like GIFs and emojis and it really like freshens up the conversation as you're saying. So, well, that was my question here. We have another one from James Jackman. He says, how would you, oh, sorry, before we have one from Hector Lowe, he says, would you ever evaluate the content of the chats of the students? Well, we, in our study, we didn't actually evaluate them. We categorized them. We, I think um, initially for us, we were interested to know what sort of functions um, of, of language and um, what sort of role that chat played, if any, in sort of substantive academic input. And actually we found that it, it did play a role. All right, yeah. Um, now we have another question from James Jackman. He says, how would you encourage students' participation through chat while in a lecture? Um, those, I mean, uh, from the data set, uh, which was from Queensland um, of the, postgraduate and undergraduate students, those conditions were set up very early in the first session. Um, it was made very, very clear to students about, um, you know, the sort of rules of the game, one might say. Um, so what was expected, um, what was, you know, an effective use of everybody's time. Um, so that's, and often if you had very large groups, um, there were two academics, one of whom was purely there to monitor the chat box and respond to it. Um, and the other one who was actually, um, you know, and these weren't lectures, they were actually tutorials. Um, I know that tutorials have different meanings um, in different contexts, but essentially in Australia, a, a tutorial is, is a sort of a learning experience um, that's co-constructed and interactive. All right, okay. Um, yeah, I think it, one of the most difficult things might be a monitor the, the chat, but I, it would be mm -hmm. great to have help from someone uh, because sometimes it is difficult to get all the questions, comments, and, and things like that. All right, well, I would like to know if we have any more questions from the audience to finish this presentation. We have them, this is the moment. Because, well, we have some uh, greetings from people. They are thanking you for the interesting presentation. Um, Cheryl Cook says that uh, digital seems to be cha uh, changing our contrast, right? Um, Tony Clark yeah, says yeah. this was a very interesting presentation. Uh, Gabriela Kaplan says that it's interesting to see how speaking evolves. And yeah, what it really is, cool. it is like yeah. expanded communication at once, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right, here we have one last question. Um, it is from Hector Lowe. He's, he says, since SMS, etc., cetera, et cetera, started, users use things more, 
wait, let me allow me one second. <laughs> Mm. Oh, yeah. So he asked what your view is on the use of codes, abbreviations, and all of these, uh, you know, these, these new uses that appear on, in informal communication. He says that some people dismiss this kind of, of inclusions. What, what is your opinion on that? Um, can I just comment? Oh, sorry, Femi, do you want to go no, first? No, 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 it's okay because because um, the, the recordings we had was from uh, from um, academic um, environment. So actually, not many people used many abbreviations or, or like calls or emoji or, or icons as you yeah as Lin said earlier. Yeah, yeah and, and what sort of interested me was that students actually corrected themselves in spelling um, quite rigorously. But then that's probably not surprising because these are all applied linguistics kind of courses. <laughs> so when they were doing that very quick sort of chat comment, then it was the next the next comment was a correction of, of actually spelling. Mm. Mm, right, so, yeah, maybe. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, okay. so sorry. So, so we found a really beautiful mix of good spoken contribution and chat contributions. But when it comes to assessment, actually, we asked a question to ourselves whether we can actually test this construct. because. We, we really couldn't figure out any assessments like, like IELTS or TOEFL or whether they can actually test this beautiful mix of everything. That's the next question we want to find out. Yes, definitely, definitely is. And well, it, I, I would like to, to go back uh, to one thing uh, mentioned by, by Hector there. And it was, uh, do you think that it should be like uh, mm, banned or that teachers should like, uh, ask students not to use, I know that you told us that they tend not to use them, maybe because it's a formal context, but if they start using them, what do you think about regulating the, those uses? Do you think we should like open the space for them to use these forms of communication through chat? Or do you think that we should like encourage, uh, a, well, the use of proper English, more formal English? I think it's an academic um, context and I think that just as in academic writing there are expectations around you know the context determines what's what's actually effective what's expected um, and so maybe I'm sort of a bit of a stickler but I, I would expect that students um, whether they're contributing through spoken or written um, forms are actually contributing something firstly substantive and secondly that's um, you know in, in a recognizable form mm -hmm. All right. Mm. Well, here we have one last question, uh, taking into account that it was something that we have already kind of discussed. Maybe you want to add something. Um, Eman Ganem, I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing it wrongly, uh, asks, do you think that participants' humor could be a feature of emotional intelligence construct? It's similar to what we discussed before, but I don't know if you want to add anything. Yeah, definitely. Actually, I think so, yes. So being able to, yeah, communicate online and then the and, and and sort of convey the emotion, emotion through online, that is really another level of intelligence, I would suppose. But maybe we need another scale. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, and now one last question, because we still have two minutes, uh, which is pretty interesting because it has some conclusion notes uh, from Galen Lee. <laughs> Uh, do you think learners might be co-constructing knowledge better virtually than when together? Yeah, I'm not sure about the quality of it, Galen, um, but certainly, um, you know, quite a few learners are very positive about it. Um, and some learners say that, I mean, they, they'd prefer to listen anyway, um, even even if they're in a face-to-face -face kind of tutorial, um, they would be the ones who are mainly listening rather than contributing, even in small group tasks. So I guess it, it, um, it kind of, uh, yeah, it, it gives other modalities to in which to participate, which is really important. Yeah. Yeah, and also we can't forget that having hybrid or online teaching, actually we are really expanding the reach and accessibility of higher education. So I think it is really important for the, you know, the diversity and inclusion purposes. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, you two, for your presentation. Thanks, of course, as well to Nahal. And thank you, uh, audience, for your questions. It was a very interesting presentation, a very interesting conversation, but we have to finish now. So thank you so much, Fumio and Lynn. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.